Let's work a particular case for a proton balance problem, and then we'll look at the numerical solution using a spreadsheet. Let's take a diprotic acid, oxalic acid will do here, and let's think about the steps that go on in the different ions formed. And we then have three family members in a diprotic species. Let's consider a situation where we add some of the acid form. So there is a net concentration of that. Let's suppose after the two ingredients mix, we have a 0.2 molar analytical concentration for the acid form. Also, we're going to add some sodium hydrogen oxalate, and let's let that be 0.3 molar after mixing. Now, we've got two different reference species. Let's first con consider the proton balance equation. The diprotic species as the reference. So this is our reference. That won't show up in the proton balance equation for this particular component. So anything else that shows in solution will show up in the balance, proton balance equation. We start with the proton balance for water. So the hydrogen ion is equal to the hydroxide ion. And now Whenever we have any of this metal species, we know it's proton poor compared to the starting material or reference, so it should appear on the loser side. Likewise, if we have any of the dianion, that is proton poor, it should appear on the loser side. But notice if it starts out as this material, to get to the dianion, we lose one, two protons. So we should multiply this to keep track of the total change in protons in the system. Now, we might rewrite this in terms of the alpha values for each of those species. So it'd be alpha times alpha for the monoprotic form, the oxalate, times the source at which this is coming from, di protic form, or its molarity is 0 0.20, plus 2 times the alpha for the oxalate dianion species, times the concentration where the material is coming from. Again, it's coming from the diprotic form, so it's 0.2 molar. So that's a PBE for the, the diprotic form. When we add the sodium hydrogen oxalate as the reference form, now this species won't show in the proton balance. Only the other species in the family show up. So again, we start with the hydrogen balance for water. And whenever we find the diprotic species, this is rich compared to the amount, the material we dumped in, or the reference, so it's on the winner side. The dianion is proton poor compared to the reference compound, so it shows up on the right hand side. And this time it only we only count it once because it's only the change of one proton in going from the reference to that species. Let's rewrite this in terms of alpha. So alpha H2 oxalate times the reference uh, analytical concentration of the reference. That's 0 0.30 plus the hydrogen ion is equal to the hydroxide ion plus alpha for the oxalate dianion times the analytical concentration of the reference, in this case again, 0 0.3 molar. 
So the net PBE should be the sum of these two expressions. And again, we only write the hydrogen and the hydroxide ion once. That's the only difference. Now we bring down all the other terms. The only other term on the left-hand side is alpha H2 oxalate times 0.3 molar. And on the right-hand side, we have the oxalate dianion times 0.3. Then we have the alpha for the H oxalate times 0.2. and then two times alpha for the oxalate dianion times 0.2. And there we have the net PBE. For ease of discussion, I'm going to call this the left-hand side, or just LHS, for the left-hand side of the equation, and all of this, the right-hand side of the equation, or RHS. I'm going to define a function, I'll call a pointer function, and I'll define it as P is equal to the absolute value of LHS, or left-hand side, minus the right-hand side. Okay. Now, if this equation is true at the pH that gives us the correct true solution pH of the system, then the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, so this ought to go to zero. And the closer we get to those conditions, the closer the difference is to zero. So this is the way we're going to go about solving we're going to plug in different pHs and evaluate the two sides and our pointer function and find that pH at which the pointer function approaches zero. That should be the true solution pH for the system. Let's think about some of the things that we're going to need to calculate in our spreadsheet. One of them is the alpha value for the diprotic species. Now it might be worth our while to express this in terms of a denominator that will be the same for all of our alphas for this particular family. And the denominator is just equal to H plus for a diprotic species that's squared and plus Ka1 which we'll be able to look up in a table times H plus, plus Ka1, Ka2. So we'll be able to look those up. At each pH, we'll have a new H plus concentration, a new denominator. So for the diprotic fraction, we take the first term from our denominator, and that becomes the numerator. So there is how we calculate the alpha for the diprotic species. And likewise, for the monoprotic species, it's the same denominator, and it's this middle term, because that's our middle species. And the fraction that's in the dianion form will be over the same denominator, but now it's the last term in the numerator, Ka1, Ka2. For hydroxide, that's important at high pH as well. We'll calculate that as Kw divided by the H plus concentration. So as we change pH, we can calculate hydroxide directly, and we'll say that that's Kw is 10 to the minus 14 over and of course over hydrogen ion. Okay, so I've got the spreadsheet opened up here, and what I've done is to copy over the equation 
so I can have it in front of me as I work. I've also transferred the equation that I'm going to need for the denominator for my alpha values, and this is the one we worked out just a moment ago. I looked up the Ka values for oxalic acid, and those are written here. I've labeled them and uh, labeled the, put in one of these cells, the analytical concentration for the diprotic acid and for the sodium hydrogen oxalate, and have written that concentration in here. Uh, we're going to put in various pHs, so I'll just enter that first column. And let's start with one in the first box there. Now I want to go from there in steps of half a pH unit up to 14. So let's do a fill in the series. And then we'll do this in columns. And the step value we want is 0 0.5 pH units. And it'll be a linear step. And let's stop at pH 14. Say OK. And it does this automatically for me. Very nice. The next box ought to be the hydrogen ion concentration. So we put that in that, this box. And of course, that we can calculate from the pH. And so our formula is equals 10 and raised to the power, we use this shift 6 or caret, minus, and we want the pH here, so we'll just click on A14 and then enter, and it does the calculation for us. So let's copy that formula all the way down. So we copy and just paste that formula all the way down and it does the calculation nicely for us. We're going to need the hydroxide concentration. And of course, that is just equal to Kw, 1 e to the minus 14, divided by the H plus concentration, which I can find in the neighboring column enter that. And so let's just copy that formula all the way down. So we copy and we paste. We're going to need a few other things. Alpha values will be one of the things. Let's actually calculate this denominator. We could do that all at once if we want. So D is equal to H plus squared. So it would be this carrot Two plus Ka1, and that's in this cell, times, which would be star, H plus, which would be that, plus Ka1 times Ka2. Now, when we do this, we want this to go back and get the same data from the same box or same cell each time. That means we should use an absolute address. And the best way to do that is to put a dollar sign in front of the, the letter and the row number for each of those terms. So we need to come back to E10 each time to get Ka1. So that's in a couple of our places in our equation. And we need to come back to the same cell for Ka2 each time. So do that one again. Now we can copy and paste that down. And that's done for us each time. Now we might want to do the alpha values in each case. And the alpha, and I'm just going to go for H2 ox. And you may have subscripts on your version of Excel. You can use other ways of abbreviating that, but this is the way I'll recognize it. And in that case, I need to tell it to square 
h plus and we'll divide by the value of d and there I've got alpha and the rest we can continue to build up in this manner as we go for each of the other terms here and I've calculated p which is the right hand side minus the left hand side and taken the absolute value of that. And I've also calculated uh, the log of p, which uh, is important because p will change over several orders of magnitude. And we'd like to see that all displayed in one graph. So let's copy this rest of these formulas down into the other boxes, all the way down to pH 14. And there we go. I'd like to plot log p versus pH. So let's copy the pH row here and reposition it over here just for convenience. And let's copy this row for the log p. And let's paste this uh, paste the values only. So this is a special, paste special, and we want the values only so that, that the reference to other calculation uh, cells for the calculation doesn't change. Now we can take this down to pH 14 and let's insert a chart. And let's do a scatter chart. And let's connect the dots in this particular case. And there we have our plot. And we can increase it for a little bit better clarity. We see that it's closest to zero around pH 1.5. We might want to get a little bit more resolution there than just half a pH unit. So we can copy the equations for everything in the first row and do our series in smaller steps. Then we might go from pH 1 to pH 2 in steps of 0 0.01. And when we do that, this is what we get for our graph. And we see that it bottoms out or hits its true value at a value of 1.53 for the pH.